Hello, everyone. This is Jamie Chilwright with Madlet Musings. And today I'm really excited to have a special guest with us. She is coming out with a book called Relentless Joy, Finding Freedom, Passion, and Happiness, Even When You Have to Fight for It. Mm -hmm. So I will let you introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So I have gone by many, many titles in my life. <laughs> um, I'm a former national sportscaster. I um, have done a lot of different things. Um, I now am a national speaker. You know, people will say I'm a, a motivational speaker and I'm like, Hi, yeah, but I'm also like a teacher and a mentor and a friend and an aunt. And a... Anyway, so I, I do that now. I, I created a movement called I'm Changing the Narrative, mm -hmm. but I'm also most importantly now a wife and a bonus mom. Um, I got oh. married about a year and a half ago and before that, I had a dog and I was only responsible for a dog. And now I'm responsible for um, uh, another human and my husband and four bonus children. And so I'm very, very blessed. Oh, that sounds so exciting. I love that. I had a dog and now I've got all this. <laughs> when I say that, people's eyes go, wow. You know, like, wow. I'm like, I know, but they are the biggest blessings. And yeah, I, I didn't know my heart. I already have a large heart. Um, and I, I heard somebody say this the other day, uh, and I, I posted about it, and I think this works right here. And it was talking about this child, about this woman was talking about raising this sensitive child, because it was okay. a, a video of this child that was crying at the sunset. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what a blessing it was, and, you know, privilege to raise a sensitive child. And I said, you know, this was me then, and this is me now. And what a gift it would have been at that age to know that my sensitivity was a mm -hmm. superpower. Yes. And, that, and that it was not a hindrance. And then I, I I teach when I'm teaching young women and young men, I'll say, you're not too of anything. You're not too much, too stupid, too short, too this, too that. I said, you're too amazing. You're too, yeah. stupid, you're too perfectly made. You know, you're too, all those things. Right. And so I just would have loved to known when I was six or five mm -hmm. or any of those things, not for my parents, because they were great, but from just voices around that, you know, don't yeah. be so sensitive, toughen up, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. and if I would have known that my huge heart at that time was a superpower, my gracious, um, it'd have been something special. And I know now, and these kids and, and my husband have made it grow, you know, wow. ginormous. <laughs> that's, that's so awesome. Kids have a way of doing that though. They just kind of get into your heart and you're just like, oh, I didn't know this existed within me. <laughs> my my bonus daughter texted me the other day something mm -hmm. and she's not a she's we do our love languages and all that and right and she's you know she's very loving but she said you know something effective if I haven't told you lately how, just how much I love you and man and I gave her all the crying emojis and I said yeah. I'm this somewhere you know thank you so yeah it's a that's good awesome story. that's awesome I have an 11 year old son and uh this weekend was this the two-year anniversary from when my mom passed away and he was extremely close to nanny as he called her and he's my little sensitive. So he came downstairs and was trying to, you know, suck it up and mommy, I really miss nanny. And I just said, buddy, just let it out. And I said, do you know how blessed you are to have someone who has given you so much love mm -hmm. that you can cry such happy tears mm -hmm. of missing her um, and know that her love has still continued you know, I said, she's, she's still loving you from, from being next to Jesus. And, and those kids, they just, they do, they just get under your skin. And then you're just like, oh, wow. I learned so much just from that one moment of just saying, Hey, embrace your grief, embrace the gifts that God's given you that you can grieve over the missing of, um, and then look forward to the joy of what's yet to come. And, um, so, yeah, I guess I'm just saying that with no point other than to say I relate. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say this with no point other than to give you your roses right now because you give people their roses while they're alive. Yeah. It's got a really good mom. Uh, <laughs> you're a really good mom. You know, if, if I could give that little dose of, of reality and love to so many other parents out there that are still stuck in these emotional ways of, especially for young men, you know, don't mm -hmm. cry. That's weak. Toughen up. I use this example when I'm speaking at colleges, yeah. especially to men. I say, let, let's just look back at some, some things that were, that were imprinted on you when you were little. And I'm not mad at your mama or your granddaddy or your granddaddy's granddaddy's granddaddy, but let's just say you have a twin sister and you're playing out in the, you know, in the, in the front of the house and, and she scrapes her knee on the, on the pavement. What do we do to the little girl? Oh, oh. What do we do to the little boy? And they scream, toughen up, you know, yep. man, up, put some dirt on, don't cry. 
Right. And so they, you start to see their like level of understanding um, really dawn on them, you know, mm -hmm. and, it, and it becomes present. And so, you know, I just love that you're telling your son express it because there's a yeah. great book called The Body Keeps the Score. It's one mm. of my it's a fantastic book. I, I study a lot of psychology and human nature and people. And it just talks about how trauma held on to trauma mm. can cause chronic illness in the body. Absolutely. And you don't let that grief out. I lost my mom um, remarkably. I don't know how I'm alive four years later, but I lost my mom four years ago. And, mm. and I learned very, very quickly. And then losing my dad a couple of years before that, that if you do not um, release your tears, your yeah. grief, it will eat you alive. Yes. Literally. Yes, it will. It will. It will. And, you know, th I think culture and traditions, et cetera, too, have made um, sensitivity this this like you were saying such a feminine thing but what hasn't been communicated to the boys of the world and i'm sort of passionate about this is its strength yes. and it's a different strength that a that that a man's sensitive heart can show versus a woman's because we have different sensitivities even within that um measuring stick and and his sensitivities are so different than mine and i'm just like dude Take it, love it, yes, embrace and your it. Your wife is going to tell them, you know, who you right. marry today is going to be so blessed that you can talk about your feelings and express your feelings. Woo! Right, right. Yes. Or, or else she'll be like, um, mother in law. <laughs> yeah, you should have told him to tap it up a little because he cries all the time. <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's great. Oh, fun, fun. Okay. Well, we sure dived in really fast, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is super, super cool. Um, and I don't even know if I said your name now that I save it, but you're Rachel Joy and pronounce the last name for me. Barbo. It's okay. The I is okay. silent. Yeah. yeah well, and I live near a town called Baraboo, mm -hmm. which is spelled very similar, but it's just yep. B-O-O. So yeah, I didn't want to like call you by my hometown's name. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Okay. So reading through your book, you have a couple like really interesting points that I circled. So if I were to do a very short staccato biography of who you are for people who aren't familiar with you, um, you were adopted by your father at 18 months old. Yep. Interestingly, I was adopted as well. Um, I battled an addiction to hard drugs. He wrote, I was the first and only known, I love this, the first and only known female sportscaster to ever fully participate in a semi or professional football training camp. And we could literally just stop there. And I would be like, you are the bravest soul. <laughs> and I'm built close to the ground too, which makes it even more. <laughs> well, the, the line that I didn't circle to read, but I'll read it now was I was beaten black and blue <laughs> after seven days of being tackled. Were you seriously full on tackled? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, there's nothing that can prepare you for that. Like I thought I'm going to train a little bit and do this. There's nothing that can prepare you for getting tackled by grown men. Well, I'd say you'd like fully immerse yourself in the research of your career. I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, and then as if that wasn't enough, you went on to climb the world's tallest freestanding mountain, Kilimanjaro, which I love the motivation for that though. Um, and that was for former NFL player, Kevin Turner, when his battle with ALS. So it sounds like you were pretty good friends with him. That's awesome. And then you were the first female host on Sirius XM Collegiate Sports Station. Yes. <laughs> so cool. So cool. And then um, what I'm really excited about is the movement that you started, the hashtag I'm changing the narrative. So tell us a little bit about that and then we'll dive into your book. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I created it. I saw a problem. I, I believe that God equips us with tools we see problems and we're supposed to take those tools, particularly our shovel. I talk about a lot in the book and, and do the work. And I was just audacious enough to believe that I could affect change. And so uh, I saw a problem again in 2016. It was a very dark summer in college football. Mm -hmm. We were on the heels of Penn State. We we're in the thick of the Baylor football scandal. Yeah. There were domestic violence, sexual violence going on all over the country. And I remember doing shows. I just moved to Nashville and I was doing shows and, and I was like, oh my gracious, like this is, I would like go to the break and cry. I'm like, mm -hmm. what is going on here? I've given my life to covering this sport and it's breaking my heart. Mm -hmm. And, and so I wrote the short curriculum and it was like, who are you away from the football field? What makes your heart beat faster? What were you born for? 
And I thought I would take it into high schools. I never put two and two together thinking, I never put two and two together thinking I would go into colleges, even though I was a college football reporter. And uh, my friend, Dr. Kevin Elka, who's in the book, I uh, mentioned him. He said, you know, Rachel uh, called and he said, I'll never forget you talk about your mom. My mom and my stepdad and myself were on vacation and my brother and we were out in Jackson Hole and we were in the kitchen of this log cabin overlooking the Snake River with this, you know, Tetons mm -hmm. in the back. And they, he calls and says, by the way, FSU football wants you to come speak. And I'm like, and we were holding hands, <laughs> jumping up and down in a circle, just screaming. And I had no idea what God was going to do with it. I thought I would always be a sportscaster and I would just do these talks on the side. But fast mm -hmm. forward three years later, it had gotten so big and encompassed so much of my soul and my heart that I literally walked away from sportscasting um, and, and retired. And mm -hmm. the, the talk started as purpose, passion platform, my own experience with domestic violence and what makes your heart beat faster outside of work or athletics. But then they quickly started to encompass interpersonal relationships, this idea that there's a king, a queen or royalty inside of every one of us. Um, I had a trigger warning. I had a dark night of the soul after losing my mom mm -hmm. and I had, uh, ideations to take my own life. And, mm -hmm. I do believe I survived to go back into burning buildings with buckets of water and tell people they're not defective, they're not broken, they're not weak, and there is hope. And right. so I'll do that for the rest of my life. And so now it's mental health, interpersonal relationships, purpose, passion, platform, you know, purpose beyond your job and joy. We talk about joy now too. Um, so it's really just grown and where it started was in one college football meeting room. And now I've worked in seven years with over 60 colleges, many of wow. them times, the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Northern Sun, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, law enforcement in multiple states, halfway houses, I'm going into prisons, high schools, K through five, churches, corporations, basically anywhere where they'll have me and what I say uh, to finally land my plane, what I say, <laughs> whether you're six or 96, you're never yeah. too old or too young to be who you were created to be. Right, right. And I love that too, because you have a line in your book that says there's a difference between a life burning to the ground and a soul on fire. And I <laughs> love, I love that line. Cause I'm like, I think so often, even with tragedies, whether we caused them or something else caused them to us or whatever the situation may be, we just see like the world is just, it's an apocalypse. We talk about our apocalypse and it's different when you can walk through the apocalypse with a soul on fire and I was, I was um, chatting with somebody because the book that I, I released this spring um, was really thematic with the concept of refuge. And I had to do a study on the, the difference between refuge and rescue. And what really struck me was rescue is when you're taken and you're removed from the fire. You know, you're completely out of it and you're saved. But refuge is that little chasm, that little air pocket within as everything's raging around you and you're still going to go through it. Like God's not taking you out. He's just giving you a moment of refuge and he's mm. promised to do that. And then I read that line in here. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah. I love this woman and I love this book. <laughs> And you just wait till you read um, The Garden Tomb. When you read that chapter, okay. the refuge um, theme will really come um, barreling back to you. Mm. I, I will give this short little nugget. I won't tell the whole story, but I was in uh, Israel in uh, 2018 and I was in the tomb and um, mm. which is just overwhelming, by the right, way. Right. I mean, I, you know, I've, I had fake eyelashes at the time. They were all matted and knotted, you know, swollen face. I was crying so hard. We were having, I mean, just this beyond ourselves, you know, Holy Spirit moment struck down. And I was stooping because the, the door is small to leave the tomb. And I heard God say to me, my girl, my girl. And he said to me, whatever you think is the worst thing that could happen to you, just know I've got you. Mm. And in my peon brain, I think I, I, I think looking back, it was this, I'd already lost my dad. So yeah. I, I couldn't think even fathom of losing another parent. Plus my mother was very, very healthy. Um, and I, I thought in my peon brain, well, I'm gonna lose my house. Or what does that mean? Mm. God, what, what does that mean? And, and this is the God that I want people to know people that are church hurt or are not raised in a faithful family or think God is mad and vengeful or think religion is bad or any of those things. I want them to know. And I say this in the book, you know, whether 
your tr- any of those things, at the very least, I want you to come out of this book thinking this Jesus was a really rad dude, you know, because, yeah. he, because he was and he is. So I'm stooping to leave. And he says that to me and, and, and it's just, it's in there, but I don't think too much about it. And um, Jamie, four uh, weeks later, my mom was diagnosed with stage four cancer and uh, eight months later, she was gone from this earth. And so what God was trying to tell me was your life is about to fall apart. And the worst thing that you could think is going to happen to you is going to happen to you. But I've got you that refuge and just get up underneath my wing. I won't forsake you. I won't mm-hmm. leave you. I love you. And I'm going to carry you through this. And I just want to scream from the mountaintops to the world. That's the God I know. And that's the God I want to share with people. Yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh. Yeah. Two years ago, um, my mom went in for gallbladder and came out with a stage four, um, stomach cancer and we had six days and she was gone. It was, it was so fast and it was so traumatic. And I was editing a book at the time where I had, of course, you know, naively written in a character who's losing their mother from cancer. And I had the edits due the weekend that she was passing away. And I was trying to plow through those while I'm sitting next to her on the bed. And, um, I'll, I'll say this, gosh, you're gonna make me cry now, but it's that concept of God walking us through, but also finding as, as believers, finding the joy that does take away the sting of death. Cause I was, I was shouting at God going, okay, you lied <laughs> because where death awares thy sting was like, yeah, it's right here. I gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's all through me right now. But then it dawned on me as we were going through this is like, and it's that concept of being in the tomb, the resurrection was like, that's the sting is the finality. And there's no finality. There's just a gap of missing and the grief is in the missing. And then of course, today I'm looking at your book and I love this. Let me share an important truth with you. You will die. Duh. First of all, I love that, (laughs) but your ripple will live on. You may never know who you affected others in this life. Oh gosh, I can't see. And your light and your sheer life force, your smile and your generosity. Don't ever let anyone talk you out of making an impact, of living with joy, of sharing random compliments with complete strangers. I'll chase someone down just to tell them something great about themselves. Gosh, the day that we told my kids that Nanny was going to go away she wanted us to bring the kids over and I'll never forget. She lived that paragraph to the fullest. She looked at the kids. She had balloons blown up. She says, we're going to have a balloon fight in the living room because we're going to celebrate because I get to move to heaven. (laughs) And one of the last memories my kids have is celebrating with my mom with a balloon fight. And as I held my son yesterday, as he was crying because it's two years since she's passed, I asked him, what do you remember? What do you remember? Because he said, I just, if I'd seen her the day she died, if I'd said goodbye, maybe something would feel different. I said, well, what do you remember of your last memory? And I said, he goes, hitting balloons and laughing. I said, that's her legacy. Exactly. That's what she wanted you to remember. And can you even imagine just for a moment, can you even imagine what our mamas are experiencing in heaven right now? Gosh. That just gets me every time, you know, I have studied a lot of, uh, and listened to a lot of near death experiences of, of people that weren't believers that God gave a second chance and came back or believers or miraculous stories. And one of the things they, that a lot of people say is that, that the angels, whatever your childhood, favorite childhood smell Jamie is Mm -hmm. like whatever it is like for me it was my grandmother's gardenias in her front yard they were like the big gardenias the size Mm -hmm. of a hand and so I've always loved gardenias but they say multiple people say that these angels these big big beings that they smell like whatever your childhood smelled like oh my gosh I hope so (laughs) <laughs> great people from all over the world that have never met each other have had these same experiences. And this one guy says, you know, it's not like warm tapioca pudding, you know, like in my <laughs> mom's kitchen. And so I, love it. I, I just like, it's just, and they, yeah, I, I can't 
even, I can't even fathom it. And I know that's, you know, we're not supposed to be able to, and mm-hmm. all that. I just think when I, um, when I get sad, like, you know, like you, like everybody who's experienced loss, mm-hmm. I just think about what they're experiencing up there and right. that we'll be reunited mm-hmm. and that we will spend all of eternity together. And that just blows my ever loving little mind. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I keep telling my kids, I said, do you realize what's really cool about <laughs> You know, I don't necessarily word it the right way. Do you know what's really cool about Nanny dying? And they look at me and they're like, what? And I'm like, it's our last goodbye. Mm. I said, we never have to say it again. Mm. So the next time you see her, you, that fear of having that last goodbye is already behind you. Mm. And we get to move forward. Um, and all that brokenness of the world is just over. It's just done. But in the meantime... <laughs> We have to get through this world. And so we have to find joy through it. And you you also mentioned something here. And I'm just going to say the two words because I, I zoned in on those and you can explain it. Funky junk. <laughs> Funky junk. It is our, it is the junk that weighs us down. It is yeah. bitterness, trauma, anger, unforgiveness, resentment, abuse, um, all of the funky ju- regret, like all the junk that weighs us down. And mm-hmm. if you do not deal with it and you do not acknowledge it, it will eat you alive. And um, many, many people have never experienced their true greatness, their legacy, mm-hmm. true greatness in relationships, vulnerability because of funky junk. And my goal is, in speaking and writing this book and all the things that I do is teaching people. I heard somebody say this one time. And if I know somebody said something, I always give them credit, but I can't remember where this came from, but it's, it's, you know, talking about the spiritual backpack. And so Jamie, my parents got divorced when I was little brick in the backpack, you know, Mm -hmm. began to use drugs and alcohol when I was in high school, brick in the backpack, um, you know, got addicted to, you know, hard drugs in my tw- brick in the backpack, right? Mm-hmm. So like, you're carrying around these bricks in this backpack and they're invisible and we're showing up at work and we're showing up in relationships and we, and people can't see the invisible backpack. And what mm-hmm. I'm doing is begging people to acknowledge the funky junk bricks that are in there and then start to take those out. And that might mean look like, you know, therapy and mm-hmm. Jesus. You know, mm-hmm. always Jesus. I'm I'm an, I'm an advocate for him always, but Jesus and medication. You right. know, I, I don't know what that looks like for you, but I I know that you cannot live the life that you are meant to live until you sit down and get comfortable with your junk, and then begin to disassemble that junk. Right, right. And you know, being able to look back to and you know having been adopted, I was I was two weeks old when I was adopted, and I I was just going through a study for my next book of the overlooked element of, especially my generation when adoptions were closed and files were sealed of that when you were a baby adopted, you couldn't have felt abandoned Mm. because you were too little. And I had a couple of years ago through some really intense therapy. um, And I sat next to my husband on the couch because my, my psychologist had asked him to come in um, because my husband was questioning what is going on. And I finally looked at him and I said, I firmly firmly believe that everyone in your life, no matter how much they love you, you only have so much capital. And when you've used it up, Mm. they will leave. Mm. And for the first time he turned to me and we'd been married like 20 years by then. He turns to me and he goes, not with me. And it was such a breaking point, but looking back and you have all these struggles, these bricks, this funky junk, like you're talking about, um, I could hate it and I could, I could regret it or I can look at it now and say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not happy. I went through that and that was right. painful, right. but thank you, Lord. And how can we use that? Amen. And that's what I, I talk about. And I want to say, just confirm something, affirm, confirm something that you studied um, in therapy work and brain spotting some different modalities mm-hmm. I've used in therapy. Uh, one particular time they're like, where are you? They kind of, you know, like asked, and I was in utero um, mm-hmm. and I literally felt my mom's uh, fear and, and because I was born out of wedlock and 
And I, I, I felt her fear. I felt um, not her shame. Other people was trying to put their shame on her. Mm-hmm. And so to the studies now are rampant. There are many, many studies, as you know, that that obviously you have your feelings are passed on. Right. And right. that. <laughs> the, so anyway, yes, mm-hmm. I just wanted to confirm that. And it's a fascinating uh, study to study, you know, obviously a baby growing and, and that those relationships, but then also the inner child work, woo, <laughs> right? Some other like stuff. And I always, you know, my, my job as a, a speaker and a mental health advocate is to push people towards therapy and towards, you know, right. uh, um, uh, people that are qualified. I'm just a, a street therapist, if you will, but I do encourage people to get into the inner child work and to mm-hmm. study it because, all, all of us are, are little people walking around wanting to be loved, wanting yep. to feel safe, wanting to feel appreciated, wanting to feel seen, wanting to feel valued. And if little you didn't feel any of those things, you're going to act that out in your adult life. Right. You sit with little you and heal what you didn't get, what you didn't see. And I conversely tell people all the time, hurt people, hurt people, but also healed people, heal people. So if you saw good love growing up, then go teach people what good love right? Was. Because if you haven't seen it, all you do is go repeat generational patterns until somebody, Jesus, you, therapy, all of the above decides enough is enough. And I'm mm-hmm. sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what the question good. was. I'm I don't sorry. either. I, I don't either. <laughs> I'm not sure there was a question. I think we were just going back and forth and feeding off of each other. But yeah. I, you know, this is just what's so exciting. And and I think um, I, I have a passion within the Christian church right now too, of, you know, looking, looking at death, looking at trauma, looking at our backgrounds, our mistakes, our, our, you know, whatever we went through and finding hope within those instead of focusing on the guilt, the shame, yes. the regrets, um, and this concept that somehow we're supposed to be so humble that we allow those things to be what humbles us, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Like we, sense. we allow those bricks, so to say, to weigh us so much down that, well, we have to carry them because otherwise, if we achieve some sort of greatness within God's plan, we're proud. Um, but just being that person who's like, I'm going to throw these bricks off and I'm going to walk forward. And it's only by the grace of God. It's nothing I've done. That's when you got like, the, wow, this greatness is God within me. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I've noticed something recently too. I put a post out and I said, you know, the post was like, I've never been more proud of myself at a, a certain point in my, you know, any other point in my life. I said, you know, I've, I'm working on a lot of stuff and I got a long way to go and I'm so imperfect, but here's the things I'm really proud of right now. And I said, I said, um, shout out something you're proud of. And my normally very, um, you know, talkative audience they liked it, like, you know, a bunch mm. of them liked it, but they wouldn't say it about themselves. Yeah. And I, was, I took it one step further and I said, this is where we got it messed up. We're out here looking for other people to love us and affirm us and lift us up. And we don't even love ourselves first. And there is a healthy place inside of us where you can be proud of yourself and love yourself. And it's not egotistical. It's right. not healthy. It is. I am a miracle. God did not take the day off when he made me. I said in the book, you know, God didn't go to the heavenly Panera the day you were born, you know, like there was, <laughs> you weren't like on the defective line, like you, he made you. And so I encourage people to start loving themselves yeah. radically. And I say, I love myself enough to say I need work. And I got a therapist appointment this afternoon and there's some stuff I need to work on and I want to be better here. And so it's not a loving myself like, ooh, I'm perfect. It's loving right. myself enough to know that I have blind spots, but I love myself radically and deeply. And that's what changed for me. Mm-hmm. And and that's been this metamorphosis for me. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. And so, um, I mean, I could talk for hours, but that would be abusive of your time. So Can I should probably wrap this again. Can we like have a part two? Yeah, I think we should have a part two and a part three and a part four. <laughs> Please. I love it. <laughs> it's so great. It's so great. But your book is written in a way where um, people can pick it up. It's also good for book clubs yes. um, or devotions, you know, women's groups at churches, etc. So it's one of those books that's written not just as a read it from cover to cover, but read a little bit, digest it, take yep. notes, talk about it. Yep. Um, and it and, comes- I wrote, and thank you for noticing that. I just want to yeah. say that. 
I wrote it like that. My um, pie in the sky book, I think we all have like as authors, we have like a book that like inspired us. Mm -hmm. And my book that the the book that inspired me was Love Does by Bob Goff. Mm -hmm. And I love that book because it was just these short, punchy stories that were like really simply written, but yeah, you know, hey, I want to leak Jesus, like this old rusty Jeep I have. And so I think I used that in the book. And so I wanted people to be able to say, I can read 17 before I read three and I can read five and, mm-hmm. I can read six, and then there's journal space in the back. And then what I find to be very cool about the book is at the end of each chapter, there's something called a joy start. Okay. And it's like a jump start for your car, but a joy start for your soul. And it's where we, you have the opportunity to take what I just shared and taught and apply it to your life, yeah. right? There. Like right then yeah. and there, turn to the back, journal about it, do it. Like life is precious and it's short and do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, the book is called Relentless Joy, Finding Freedom, Passion and Happiness, parentheses, even when you have to fight for it, parentheses. <laughs> Um, and Rachel, how do people, if they want to follow you, find out more about your ministries, et cetera, where should we send people to go? Yes, absolutely. So right now, um, until the book launches on June 20th, um, and then maybe after, but right now, uh, you probably know, uh, and I'll tell your listeners, the importance of pre-orders are huge and huge. Our- they um, need to judge us by uh, by pre-orders. So you can go anywhere where books are sold and grab a copy. But if you go to rachelbarbeau.com, um, you'll see book. You'll just click on the book and it'll it'll pop up there for you. But what we are doing um, is I visit a Christian halfway house called The Love Lady. And I wrote about it in the book. I've been there for 10 years. I've been visiting there, giving my testimony for 10 years, twice a year. And I'm going into Sunday after my book launches, the 25th of June. And I want to give every woman in there a copy. And so we have created bonuses. So if you buy five copies to donate for you or for your office, if you buy 10 copies, if you buy 100 copies, you get these certain things. And we can even give you a tax write-off if needed. But I want to give every one of those women uh, a a book. Yeah. And your listeners can help me accomplish that. And so they can go to rachelbarbo.com backslash book. And then I'm on socials at Rachel Barbeau and I love meeting people, talking to people. I answer my own DMs. Um, I, you know, <laughs> I always laugh when people are so insulated, you can't even get to them, you know, and I'm like, right. I'm not insulated. My email comes to me, you know, I read my own email. So, um, so I love connecting with people. That's awesome. That's awesome. So yes, definitely pre-orders. Pre-orders are, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it to readers. It's just, it's just part of the business, but they are so important. And especially when you have, a ministry and a message that needs to get out to the world. So um, hop over there, grab your book, grab a book for your mom, your sister, your aunt, your niece, your daughter, your church Bible study group. It's going to be great. I'm actually going to do this for a Bible study. Make my daughter do it with me. Please. That is so, that's so amazing. My old church in Nashville, I just got word um, that they're using it for their small groups Mm -hmm. and it's a large church. I'm like, what? Yeah. Go, bad, go. Yay. Awesome. Well, Rachel, this was so much fun. And yes, hopefully we'll have you back again. And But in the meantime, thank you so much for allowing the Lord to shine through you and bring joy into a world that really needs it. Well, thank you, my friend. I can't wait to do it again.